you know, that's over 40, that they have slower metabolism, that they work a little harder to stay thin. So today we're going to talk about metabolism. That's the goal. And lots of details. Like I said, I'm going to have my, hand, my uh, textbook handy here because there's a lot of diagrams in your textbook. But I did not want to get this PowerPoint to be 80 slides. So I'm going to just refer to the diagrams as much as I can, but trying to limit the, the content because there's a lot of content when we talk about metabolism. So when you get really, really in depth in some of these topics, I use the term seeing the forest through the trees because sometimes we spend so much time analyzing the trees that we forget about the forest. And the forest would be like the whole body, what we can see happening in our patient. But we can get down looking at a molecule and looking at hydrogen atoms coming and going from a molecule. That's the trees. That's the detail. So we're going to zoom out and say just real basically what drives metabolism? What drives metabolism? What feeds metabolism? There's an even better hint. What? Food, yeah. Food drives metabolism. If we don't have food, we can't feed these reactions because all reactions require energy and all of our energy comes from food, right? So what is the first recipient of this? Well, what are the types of foods we bring in the body? What did we talk about? Carbs. Carbs, proteins, fats, lipids, same thing. And lastly, what's the other category of organic molecules, nucleic acids, right? DNA, RNA. So those are the four major categories of organic molecules. So proteins, fats, carbohydrates are the key components of our diet. So we bring that in. What's the first organ to receive those necessary macromolecules? What system? The digestive system. So the digestive system, the job of the digestive system is to take this food and break it down into smaller pieces so our cells can use it for energy, right? To, to do more things, to make new things. We talked about all the different organic molecules last week. To make insulin and hemoglobin and aldosterone, testosterone, we need the basic building blocks of those molecules. And those basic building blocks come from the digestion of the food molecules we bring into the body. So the GI tract digests the food. Enzymes in the digestive tract are responsible for digesting that food. And then it's absorbed into the cells that line the digestive tract. They further digest into smaller components. And then that is passed to what? What is the next recipient to receive those digested molecules? So you have the digestive tract, the cells that line the digestive tract, and then what's next? The blood, very good, yeah, the blood. So the blood receives those digestive molecules, and now they're available for every cell in the body to use. So every tissue in the body is made up of cells, and its job is to take these molecules and bring them into the cell and use them for energy. So enzymes are key inside cells in the digestive tract. They're the key component to making met metabolism happen. All right, so all the metabolic reactions occur where? Specifically, the metabolic reactions we're going to talk about today, where do they occur? Inside cells, right? Inside cells. So there's two types of metabolic reactions that we're going to talk about that start. One is the precursor to ATP production. But we'll go into that in just a minute. So some basic terminology. Metabolism is just all the biochemical reactions occurring in the body. They involve those nutrients, proteins, carbs, lipids. Two different types of metabolism. One talks about building up. The other one is a breaking down. So anabolism is the building. So once we bring these tiny molecules into the cell, we use it to make insulin or we use it to make collagen. Whatever we're building inside that cell, that's an example of anabolism. You're making something with, from smaller pieces, so making a Lego tower with the tiny Legos. That's anabolism. Maybe you've heard of anabolic steroids, right? People that take testosterone supplements to build more muscle. So that's building, that's anabolic. Catabolism is the opposite of that. Digestion, like we talked about in the GI tract, is an example of catabolism. So when I think of catabolism, I think of cutting things apart. Catabolism, cutting things up, breaking it down into smaller parts. 
So when we make ATP, part of that is anabolism, right, when we're making ATP. But when we're digesting glucose to make the ATP, that's catabolism. So these reactions are linked. You have to break something down in order to build something new. So don't think of them as isolated. One fuels the other. So cellular respiration, when we think of respiration, we think breathing. In this context, cellular respiration does not involve the respiratory tract at all. We need some oxygen, which the respiratory tract supplies. But as far as the process, it's just describing the process in which we take glucose, break it down, make ATP inside of our cells. So cellular just means it's occurring inside of our cells. We're making ATP by the breaking of glucose in the presence of oxygen. And how we make ATP is we remove a phosphate. Remember we talked about ATP has three phosphates attached to it, which have high energy bonds. When we remove a phosphate from ATP, we release energy. So that's how we fuel processes in the body. But if we want to make ATP, we have to add a phosphate to ADP to store energy. So if we want to release energy, we remove a phosphate from ATP. If we want to store energy, we add a phosphate to ADP to make ATP. Um, you know, it probably might be easier if I just open up a Word document here. And I'll make this nice and big. So if I take ADP molecules that are already in the body and I add a phosphate group to it, I get ATP and energy is stored in that molecule. If I need energy in the body, say to transport something across the membrane, I take ATP and I remove a phosphate and energy is released from the ATP, okay? So this is a reversible reaction. ATP plus, a, or ADP plus a phosphate yielding ATP. I can go the other direction and release that energy. So it just depends if you're in a catabolic reaction or anabolic reaction. Which one requires energy, do you think? Anabolic, to build something larger from something smaller requires energy. So that is going to use energy. So I'm going to use the second reaction there to release energy to be able to build my molecule. So to keep going, to keep our system going, we need to have a ready source of ATP. So the goal then of cellular respiration is to make ATP. So we talked about the different stages of breaking down the food we eat for metabolism, digestion, absorption, transport to the tissues at stage one. Stage two is processing of those molecules, making lipids, proteins, glycogen, whatever, or breaking them down into pruvic acid and acetylcoenzyme A to make ATP, depending on what the needs are. So the first one, synthesis of lipids, proteins, and glycogen inside the cell. That would be if I need to make some insulin. This is a pancreatic cell. It's bringing in those digested molecules into that pancreatic cell and making insulin with it, or making glycogen with it, or making new enzymes with it. So again, that's an example of anabolism, right? Because I'm making something larger with the smaller pieces. And then lastly, let's say I don't need any more insulin. We've got plenty of insulin to go around, but my pancreatic cells need ATP to transport insulin. So then it's going to undergo catabolism. It's going to bring that glucose into the cell. Um, not glucose, pyruvic acid. We'll get into that and make ATP from it. So that's catabolism. And then lastly, stage three is we get all these intermediate molecules that are broken down and we release more ATP. And in the process, we get, of, get rid of carbon dioxide and water as waste products. When you exhale, would everybody agree? I mean, you don't have to take advanced AMP to know that there's carbon dioxide and water in our breath, right? If you ever shut the car doors in the wintertime, you're waiting, someone's in the store shopping, it gets all steamy on the inside of the windows, right? That's because we have moisture 
water vapor in our exhale, and carbon dioxide. Those are byproducts of cellular respiration. So there's some fancy terminology that we have to kind of get understood, and one is the term of oxidation and reduction. Oxidation, we've heard of before. Oxidation, when you oxidize the metal on your car, what do we get when it's exposed to oxygen in the air? Over many years, rust, okay? If you want to fuel a fire, what do you provide to that fire? Oxygen, right? So that's why they tell people that are on free oxygen, you know, because of bad lungs to not smoke. But people do it anyway, right? Some people blow up their faces doing it, but <laughs> it's happened. Severe burns. But anyway, um, that's oxidation. So anytime we add oxygen, we call that oxidation. But as we learned more about these reactions, we also discovered that if we remove hydrogen, that also is an oxidation reaction. So a, a key thing to remember about oxidation reduction reactions, it involves hydrogen or oxygen, and it, revol and it involves a transfer of energy in that process. So if we add oxygen, we call that an oxidation reaction, and we lose energy in the process. If we remove hydrogen, we also call that oxidation, and we lose energy in that process as well. And the opposite is true for reduction reactions. So if I remove oxygen, I gain energy, and if I add hydrogen, I gain energy. So a way to remember that, some of you are saying, oh my gosh, what did she just say? I know that, <laughs> some of you are saying that, because I've been in your shoes. Um, and here's what I learned that helped me remember. It's Leo the lion goes grr. Have you heard that before in chemistry? Okay. So lose electrons ah. equals oxidation, gain electrons equals reduction. So when we lose electrons, electrons are the energy gain, are, they contain energy, right? They're the energy molecules involved in bonding, if you remember that just from your basic chemistry. So if it's something is reduced, oh, another thing I can say about this is electrons slash energy. Wow, someone's having a good time out there in the hall. So losing electrons, energy is oxidation. Gaining electrons and energy is reduction. So if these are coupled reactions, wouldn't you agree? If a molecule loses energy, the other molecule has to gain it, right? Because these are coupled reactions that we're talking about. And the law of conservation of energy says that energy is neither created nor destroyed, it only changes form. So we're switching back and forth among molecules here, and I'll talk about which molecules are doing the gaining and the losing of energy throughout this process. Okay, so enzymes, like I said, drive the process. And there's two coenzymes that you need to know. And the coenzymes that are doing the gaining and the loss, and in this case, it's hydrogen. These coenzymes, they come from B vitamins. How many times have you heard about, oh, you're really tired? Take some B complex, right? Don't we say that? Don't we tell that to pregnant moms that are really struggling, nausea, vomiting, fatigue? Take some B complex, vitamin B12, right? Because that helps metabolism. So those enzymes, those coenzymes that are going to be the energy carriers in these processes are called, let's all pronounce this together. No, you don't have to. <laughs> Nic nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. But we're just going to call it NAD+. Okay? Where this is not a biochemistry class. And flavin adenine dinucleotide, FAD. Now you've heard of these things before. The first one is niacin. Have you heard of niacin before? It's an important thing in your vitamin pills, niacin. And the second one is riboflavin. You've heard, probably heard of that one, too. That's also in your vitamin pills. So we sometimes give people that have liver dysfunction, like cirrhosis of the liver, they'll often get niacin supplements. And we'll talk about why that would be. But these are coenzymes. Their job throughout the process, when you think of these today, their job is to pick up hydrogen atoms and 
store energy, and then dump those hydrogen atoms and release that energy. That's the job of these. So think of them like a little car. They're picking up passengers and dumping them off throughout the process. And the passengers are hydrogen atoms. Okay. All right, so carbohydrate metabolism then is when we bring in molecules, we break it down into glucose. Glucose enters our cells. And how does glucose get in there? Well, is glucose, what type of bonds did we say all organic molecules are formed by? Covalent, yeah, covalent bonds. So covalent compounds are typically not, um, they don't have carriers in the membrane, specifically like, like ions. They don't break up into ions. I, they sh I shouldn't say they don't have carriers. They do have carriers, but they don't break up into ions, like sodium chloride, what an ionic compound. So as a result, glucose needs a protein carrier. It, it travels into the cell by facilitated diffusion. Do you remember what facilitated diffusion looks like or what that is? Facilitated means it needs a protein carrier because it's not an ionic compound, doesn't break up into ions. It needs to be transported across the membrane. Diffusion means that there's higher concentration always outside the cell compared to inside the cell. That's what causes it to go in. So is energy required to bring glucose into the cell if we have a high to low concentration? No, no energy is required. So when you say diffusion, it means no ATP is required to bring this glucose in. It just comes in naturally with the help of this protein carrier. But there's another piece that unlocks the cell and allows glucose in. And those of you that work in you know, nursing homes or hospitals know some of your patients lack this, and that is blood sugars are rising because this is missing in their blood. Insulin, yeah. So blood sugar can, you know, it's digested, it's absorbed to the blood, the digestive tract is working fine, but the glucose is building up because there is no insulin to open the door and allow that glucose to complete its entry into the cell. So it enters by facilitated diffusion, but insulin is also playing a role. And we'll get to that in more detail next week when we talk about endocrinology. But for now, just know that glucose is constantly coming into the cell. But once it comes in the cell, what prevents it from stopping diffusion and keeping blood sugar piling high outside the cell. A couple of things happen in there to prevent that, so we'll talk about that. But just know that for right now, we have this continued entry of glucose into the cell by facilitated diffusion and the help of insulin. So if you don't have insulin, glucose cannot get in the cell. So type 1 diabetics, the pancreatic cells that produce insulin have been damaged by autoimmune disease and they don't produce insulin. And as a result, they need insulin from an external source, like an injection, right, that they get a couple times a day. All right. So once inside the cell, they cannot release, be released from the cell, except for the liver, the kidney, the intestines, so they can reverse this reaction and dump glucose back out. So it's important for the liver to be able to do that because that is what allows glycogen 2 to be broken down and blood sugar to raise in between meals. Like if you get up in the morning and you don't eat breakfast, what keeps the glucose in your blood and keeping you from passing out is this reverse of this reaction. So you can get glucose in your blood with the help of the liver. But now again, if the liver is shot, then that doesn't happen and those people are at you know, risk for dangerous low blood sugars. So this is the key reaction we're going to summarize today in three different reactions, pathways, I should say. There's many reactions with, within one, two, and three here. So pathways, we'll call them. So the key thing up on the top, know that reaction. Know what each molecule's, you know, the formula for it is. So C6, H12, O6 is glucose. O2 is oxygen. And then on the right side, oops, this slipped, slid over, it looks like. I should just fix this quick. There. So oxygen is the gas we breathe in through our lungs. Water, carbon dioxide, those are waste products of metabolism. And then we get lots of ATP, 32 molecules of ATP, and a lot of heat in the process. Now the key thing is glucose has a lot of energy in it. Okay, in the bonds of those carbon molecules and the other bonds as well are 
are, are, is a lot of energy. But this process is only 38% efficient, which means the energy that's stored in glucose of that that is transferred to ATP, only 38% of that energy goes to that ATP molecule. And you have to know that number. That's definitely on your worksheet and on the test. It's 38%. Yep. Most machines, I think according to your textbook, are like 10 to 30%. So it's a pretty efficient machine that we are, our cells, that we can convert 38% of that energy. But where does the other 62% go? Yeah, when you get a lot of people sitting in a room like this, I've noticed that. When I have a really crowded lecture room, I'll be comfortable. It'll be winter time. I'll be comfortable. And then the room clears, and now I'm working or doing something else. I'm like, oh, it's cold in here. I didn't realize all the little heaters that students are when you get into a crowded environment. Or have you ever gone into a crowded, crowded, say, a concert hall or movie theater? You open the doors, you get blasted by this heat and moisture. That's the byproducts of cellular respiration of everybody in that room. And think about when you have like a glass of water and it's sweating on the outside in that environment. Where is that water coming from on the outside of your glass? from the water vapor from everybody else's exhale that's in the air. So all that metabolic waste is surrounding you in those crowded, hot environments. And that's why people can pass out, right? Their body temperatures get too high. They don't get enough oxygen because it's just a stifled environment. So 38% of that energy from glucose actually ends up in ATP, and we lose a lot along the way. So the three pathways we're going to go through now are glycolysis. It's in this order, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain. The oxidative phosphorylation, I'm not going to have you be accountable for that term. Just know the three basic pathways, glycolysis, Krebs, and electron transport chain. So here are all three reactions in a big summarizing diagram. Glycolysis, know where it occurs. Where does it occur? in the cytoplasm, in the cytoplasm. Then it creates this molecule called pyruvic acid. We're going to go into detail in each one of these. But it makes pyruvic acid. And then that enters what organelle? The mitochondria. So the, Cre the citric acid cycle is another name for the Krebs cycle. So when you see citric acid, Krebs, same thing, different name. Okay, Same exact thing, though. So citric acid Krebs cycle occurs in the mitochondria, and is, so does the electron transport chain. So these reactions start in the cytoplasm and finish in the mitochondria. So if you're talking about a heart muscle cell that's beating from the minute you were eight weeks post-conception, is about the time the heart starts to beat to the time you die, that's a lot of beating, right? It's a lot of movement of those muscle cells. So if you look inside a muscle cell, we would expect to see a lot of mitochondria because they're making, they need a lot of ATP to keep doing their job and doing it well over a lifetime, right? 80 beats a minute. Time how many minutes do you live? That's a lot of beats of that heart muscle. So that's a lot of ATP that it requires. And we know that heart muscle cells require oxygen to be efficient at that process. And if oxygen levels are low because of a narrowed vessel over the heart, the heart muscle cells suffer. And they tell the person very quickly that it's struggling. And we'll talk about that when we get to chest pain a little later. So this is just a summarizing diagram. I really like this diagram, so we'll come back to this. But we're going to go through each step now. So glycolysis, when you think of that term, just think of sugar splitting. That's the fancy name. Lysis means to split. Glyco always refers to sugar. So in this case, we're talking about glucose. So we're going to assume digestion did its job. Insulin was there. Glucose came into the cytoplasm. So it's hanging out in the cytoplasm. And the enzymes out in the cytoplasm are there to convert this, gly this glucose to two molecules of pyruvic acid. So oxygen is not required for the reactions of glycology, like glycolysis. So make sure you write that somewhere. This is an anaerobic process. But it doesn't mean that it won't happen if oxygen is there. So it, what it means is whether oxygen is there or not, glycolysis will happen. The enzymes do not require oxygen to be present. So, this does, so the first thing that has to happen is the minute that glucose enters the cytoplasm, we have to convert that glucose to a different molecule. 
So right away, ATP is broken down, two of them, two ATP are broken down, and those phosphates are added to this glucose molecule. See the glucose is a six carbon molecule. So two ATP are broken down right away. We remove a phosphate from each of those ATP and we stick it on the end. Why, why would we want to do something like that? Aren't we trying to make ATP? Now we're using ATP. That doesn't make much sense, does it? Well, the reason for this is, is because this is no longer glucose. So now my concentration gradient, I just brought glucose into the cell, right? I just added a glucose. That might slow the concentration gradient, right? Because they have all this stuff out in the blood. Well, now I've just converted this to something completely different, and that keeps my glucose concentration inside the cell low. So that's the reason for adding these phosphate molecules right away onto this. That's one of the reasons. Okay, so we form this molecule. We use two ATP in the process. So we call this activating the sugar. Now the next thing that happens is we're going to cleave the sugar, step two, which means we're just going to split this sugar into two molecules. Again, I'm not going to hold you accountable for any of these terms. This would be for someone who's you know, completing their dissertation on the Krebs cycle intermediates, but that's not our goal here today or this semester. So we're just going to talk about big picture things. So now the sugar split. So st step two, we're going to split that sugar that we just phosphorylated on either end into two molecules. Then those two molecules in step three, we are going to add, let's see, I need a pointer. Hmm. Okay. Well, now we have these coenzymes coming to play. So these, co these coenzymes are going to come in and they're going to remove a hydrogen and form pyruvic acid. So removing a hydrogen forms pyruvic acid and we have two molecules that we're doing that to, correct? So in that process, we form a total of four ATP in that process, two per molecule. So we gained four ATP and this coenzyme NAD plus just picked up a hydrogen and it gained energy in that process. Okay, so it picked up a hydrogen, gained energy. So we are picking up energy from this early molecule here, the glycealdehyde 3 phosphate and the dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Again, you don't have to know those terms, but just know that we took some energy from them. And some of that energy was transferred, see the phosphate on each end, right? was transferred to, AT, to ADP to make ATP. So therefore, at the end, we have four molecules of ATP that we just produced and two molecules of pyruvic acid. But what's the net gain? Remember, we used two ATP early in the process, so we only gain a net of two, right? We used two, gain four, we're left over with two. So now we've got, at the end of glycolysis, the goal at the end of glycolysis is to make a little bit of ATP and to convert that glucose into something that can go into the next pathway. So the pyruvic acid is going to feed into the next pathway. And what's the next pathway that we're going to talk about? The Krebs cycle, no, or otherwise known as the citric acid cycle. But now what happens here? What happens if there's no oxygen? So we need oxygen to enter the, pyru to enter the Krebs cycle. If no oxygen is present, what would be some examples? And here's the, here's the healthcare attachment. This is where the Krebs cycle, knowing your Krebs cycle, and glycolysis and electron transport chain makes you a better healthcare worker. Heart attack, right. If there's no oxygen because there's a clot serving the artery over the heart and the heart muscle cells are starved of blood via and oxygen, that's going to cause them to go lactic acid. So what happens is this energy that was picked up in the form of NADH is dumped off and NAD is a low energy molecule again and we form lactic acid if oxygen is not present. Okay, so that's one example. What's another example? Sepsis and what would cause that? Um, uh, if you had a really high metabolic rate, that would increase the demands of the body that breathing might not be able to supply. So anything, extreme exertion, right, would cause lactic acid to develop. Seizures would cause lactic acid to develop. Sepsis 
could cause lactic acid to build up. How about uh, choking? No oxygen coming in via the airways. Yeah. Bad lungs, emphysema, could that cause lactic acid to build up? Yeah. Anything that c prevents it from continuing down the pathway is going to cause lactic acid. Now, the good news is, though, if you're just a person who likes to exercise hard and you do regular lactic acid accumulation because of exercise, the liver's job is to take that lactic acid and convert it back to glucose if necessary. So the liver can take care of the lactic acid. But if we have oxygen, the good news is, is we continue on and this high molecule NADH H plus up in the orange square continues on and feeds energy to the Krebs cycle. But we'll talk about, or I'm sorry, um, picks up more energy. We'll talk about that. So what do we have at the end of glycolysis, did we say now? Two pyruvic acid and two ATP. And where does it occur? Cytoplasm. And does it require oxygen? No. OK, so now we're going to enter into the Krebs cycle, or what we call the citric acid cycle. So most, so far, most of the energy from glucose is tied up in these pyruvic acid molecules. So we need to get the energy out of the pyruvic acid. So the first thing that happens then is pyruvic acid enters into the mitochondria. It's actively transported there to get into the mitochondria. And then once it's in there, it is converted to acetyl coenzyme A. Can you see this here? Acetyl coenzyme A. And what happens in the process? We have another NAD plus picking up some hydrogen atoms and gaining energy. So we have more energy pickup here in this process and forming co acetyl coenzyme A. And then if you follow this pathway around, we'll see that there's more energy pickup from NAD. And in the process, oxygen combines with carbon, and carbon dioxide is released. So in the Krebs cycle, it's easy to remember, Krebs has that hard C. Carbon dioxide is produced, also has a hard C. So that's where the CO2 part of that original equation I showed you, that's where that comes from, is in the Krebs cycle. So we remove a carbon from this pyruvic acid. You can see the carbon dioxide right off the bat, right? Right off the bat, remove a carbon from pyruvic acid to form that acetyl coenzyme A. We can see carbon dioxide is formed. So we need oxygen in this early process to bind with that car carbon, release it off as carbon dioxide. So it's, oxygen is not directly used in the Krebs cycle, but we will see it enter in a more important way in the electron transport chain. So as we go around this cycle, how many, first of all, how many pyruvic acids do we have? Two from one glucose, right? So how many turns the, citric, the citric acid cycle do? Two, one per pyruvic acid molecule. So as we watch one turn, we can see carbon dioxide is being formed. More energy is being picked up along the way. And here's our other energy molecule, FAD picks up two hydrogen atoms to form FADH2. That is also picking up energy. So the process of the Krebs cycle is to convert these different carbon intermediates, the citric acid, the isocitric acid, all those. Those are called keto acids or ketones. Have you ever heard of ketosis? People that have low carbohydrate diets end up with a buildup of these keto acids or ketos ketosis. It's part of the Atkins diet. Yes? Yes. Yep, yep. So if people, mm -hmm. or um, um, just stressing the body, you know, some people have that when they participate in like an Ironman or a marathon, they're going to dump ketones because the body is burning fats instead of carbohydrates. We'll talk about that in the second part of our discussion with metabolism. So anyway, so all these different keto acids are formed in the process, and energy is picked up by NAD plus and FAD, picking up energy, forming one ATP per cycle around. So at the end of the Krebs cycle, what do we have? Two more ATP. And what is released? Yep. 
Carbon dioxide. So far we have just carbon dioxide being formed. So let's go back to my, uh, my Word document here. And I want to talk about these reactions. So we have NAD plus. I should, uh, I'll just leave it that way. And then NADH plus H plus. This is what happens in glycolysis. This, we see this reaction, right? And we also see this in the Krebs cycle along with the other reaction, which is FAD ah, forming FADH2. I'm not going to, I suppose I could fix that just to be accurate. Okay, so this reaction is reversible, which means, so this is what happens. So first of all, both of these reactions, what's happening in terms of energy? Is energy being stored, picked up by these, or released in this reaction as it goes in this direction? Right, right. So we're picking up energy, storing energy. And when does, what reactions, or what pathway uses this? the Krebs, and glycolysis. And this one is just used in, used in Krebs. So same thing, I'm just going to use dash marks, and that's just Krebs. All right, now the reverse occurs. So if I go the other direction, which is what we're going to do next, I'm going to go, I'm just going to remove my arrow and I'm going to go this way. The other way, what's happening to energy? Releasing hydrogen atoms and releasing energy. And both of these reactions, both, this looks ugly, sorry, but you get the point, right? Both occur in the electron transport chain. So I talked about how the Krebs cycle doesn't directly rely on oxygen. Because if there is not oxygen, well, I'm, not, I'm talking ahead of myself. If there's not oxygen present, those hydrogens picked up in the Krebs cycle have nowhere to go. Because oxygen, the hydrogens from oxygen bind with, I mean, the, the hydrogens from NADH plus and FADH2 combine with oxygen to form water in the electron transport chain. And then they're free to pick up some more energy early on in glycolysis in the Krebs cycle. But if there's no oxygen to pick up those hydrogen atoms in the electron transport chain, there's nothing to refuel those early stages of glycolysis, glycolysis in the Krebs cycle again. So let's just watch this animation here quick. Hopefully we have some sound, maybe not. Well, I guess we're not going to have any sound. But the key thing is pyruvic acid, when it enters the Krebs cycle, it has to be converted right to acetyl coenzyme A. And then the NADH is formed to pick up energy from those pyruvic acid molecules in the process of forming acetyl coenzyme A. So we're going to move on. That's just not working right. That's something you have to figure out with this new system. All right, so back to. The next step now, and this is the electron transport chain. So the electron transport chain, key description here is we're in the mitochondria, but the Krebs cycle occurred in the fluid of the mitochondria. 
we call that the matrix of the mitochondria. So where does the Krebs cycle occur? Mitochondrial matrix, the, the cytoplasm-like fluid inside the mitochondria. That's where the enzymes are for those, that cycle of reactions forming all those keto acids. Now, the energy picked up from NAD and FAD is carried over to the mitochondrial membrane. If you ever looked at the inside of a mitochondria, you see there's that little kind of zigzag of a membrane inside the mitochondria. That's called the cristae of the mitochondria. So it's a little membrane within the mitochondria that has these proteins embedded in it. So these are different protein carriers embedded in the mitochondrial membrane, these three here and this fourth one, that their job is to take those atoms, those hydrogen atoms, and remove them from our carrier molecules, the NADH, and it goes backwards now back to NAD+, where we started from in the beginning of glycolysis. So if we remove a hydrogen atom, what happens is the electron, remember hydrogen was slightly electronegative when we talked about the water molecule? It has an electron that kind of hangs further away from the atom. Or, I'm sorry, electropositive, sorry, electropositive. The, electro, the electron is a little further away from the atom. So what happens is that electron from hydrogen provides energy to these protein carriers, which force hydrogen ion out of the mitochondria, across the mitochondrial membrane, outside the membrane. And then that fuels a pump down further on the membrane called the ATP synthase pump. So just think of this as a pump. It makes ATP. It cycles as it cycles, it makes ATP. And what it does is it provides the phosphate, it, if this phosphorylation of ADP inside the mitochondrial membrane is combined to make ATP. So the fuel for that pump are these hydrogen ions that are pumped out of the mitochondrial membrane and they want to come back in, right, by diffusion because higher concentration outside the membrane versus inside the membrane, they just diffuse in, and that cycles that ATP pump. And that process is very efficient, and we make lots of ATP. So per glucose molecule, that will cycle that pump to make 28 ATP with one glucose. So this process, the electron transport chain, is very efficient, builds up a lot of ATP in the cell, but we need oxygen present to do that. And here we can see the hydrogen ions that come into the cell through the pump, they combine with oxygen inside the cell to form water. And that's the other waste product that we talked about that's part of the cellular respiration process, that, that waste product of water. So key things to know then, if we go back to the Word document here, this is what's releasing the hydrogen atoms to fuel that pump. So the hydrogen atoms released from NADH and FADH2, those hydrogen atoms fuel the pump, the ion H+, and the electron from that hydrogen atom primes the proteins that provides the energy to move those hydrogen atoms across the membrane. Make sense? Everybody's starting to fall out of their chair a little bit. Okay, well, let's go back <laughs> to the PowerPoint. We're through the worst of it now. We're to the end. We've got all of that 28 ATP now. Now let's put it all together, okay? So, again, those two coenzymes, NADH and FADH2, are making the hydrogen atoms from glucose, transferring it to those proteins. They use that energy to pump that across the membrane, and some of those hydrogen atoms, as they enter, form water. So they combine with oxygen to form water. So there's different coenzymes in the membrane. You don't have to know those. Coenzyme Q, have you heard of that before? Those of you that are health nutritionists, you know. These are, now this is where I would like to say I'd love to do AdvoCare because I could explain to patients, or not patients, customers, what's actually happening. And I think if you do like AdvoCare products or all those healthcare things and you are interested in selling them, I think a really good salesperson is someone who can really un explain to their customers why this is important. Because I've had AdvoCare people try to sell to me and I'm like, oh, why should I take this? Oh, it's just really good. You'll just have a lot of energy. Really? For $50 a month for this 
you know, bottle of pills, I'll have a lot of energy. Well, tell me why. Well, it's just really good for your metabolism. Oh, well, what does that mean? I don't know. So I think it would make you a better salesperson if you could at least, you know, make some sense of this. So now you've heard of riboflavin, you've heard of niacin. Now you've heard of coenzyme Q. So when people say, you know, having a good diet is important for energy, for sure, it does make a difference. When we fill our diet full of starches like sucrose and um, well, starches, polysaccharides, they don't have a lot of those vitamins in their potato chips, breads. You know, pizza is great if you have some vegetables on it, but if it's just cheese and meat, we don't have a lot of these coenzymes that feed our metabolism. That's why people that have poor diets have low energy. And sometimes they, you know, have less efficient production of some of the important neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine, things that keep our mood elevated. So people that have really poor diets, high fat diets full of just comfort food, feel good foods, have more problems with depression, obesity, low energy, poor sleep because of just poor nutrition. And what do we do as a society here in, you know, in the United States? We throw pills at people, right? We say, just here, take this pill. This will boost your serotonin. Instead of, you know, this, because the, because the, and we'll talk about this in, in this class, because this medicine binds to the receptor for serotonin and keeps it out there. Well, that's great, but how about giving someone um, a nutritional supplement to help them make more of their own ser serotonin? Isn't that more efficient than, than blocking a channel? I think so. And that's where good knowledge of a little bit of this metabolic stuff is going to make you more, you know, a savvy consumer, I think. Okay, so there's just the, the proteins in that mitochondrial membrane. We can see the energy travels downhill. Energy is released along the way and eventually cycles that pump, the ATP synthase pump. That's the goal in everything. When you take that cookie in, you're waiting all the way down the line to feed that synthase pump and make ATP from that molecule. So here's the pump. So chemiosmosis, I'm not going to hold you accountable for that term, but ATP synthase, for sure, you should know that that is a protein embedded where? Where do we find the ATP synthase pump? The cristae, which is the Right, mitochondrial membrane. That's where we would find the ATP synthase pump. And what fuels the pump? What's the gas for that pump? Hydrogen ions. They're H plus. Because we stole the electron to give energy to the proteins to do that converting of FAD and NADH. So this just des describes how the pump is um, fueled by H+, plus, but I'm not going to hold you accountable for that. But I just think that's a really cool thing, isn't it? And does it really look like that? <laughs> that pretty and nice? No, but it does look like that. So isn't that neat? That's really a, that's a scanning electron micrograph of our ATP synthase pumps in a mitochondria. So they do really have that kind of ridged appearance. So I think that's a cool picture. So here, summing it up then, we have glycolysis out in the cytoplasm making two ATP. We have the Krebs cycle making another two. And then we have up to 34 ATP. Depends on the textbook. Your textbook says 28. Some will say 34. Highly active cells make a little bit more ATP. What would be some highly active cells? Well, I mentioned one. Heart. What's another organ that's actively working every second of the day? Brain brain very active. Kidney cells are another one, maybe not as obvious, but they produce a little bit more ATP. So key thing is know where they occur, what organelle, and if it's the mitochondria, where in the mitochondria? One is in the, site, the, the fluid of the mitochondria, and that's the Krebs, and then the other one's in the membrane of the mitochondria. It's converted. It's converted to citric acid right away. If you look back at the diagram, let's go back right here. It's converted to citric acid. And that's where it gets the name citric acid cycle. Yeah. Okay. So then, um, all right, and this is just a little side note. I don't expect you to know this, but certain like cyanide gas um, prevents this pump. So it prevents that um, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen ion from fueling the pump. So there's no ATP, no ATP production kills people. 
So again, 38% efficiency. That's the key thing to know off of this slide. We're 38% efficient in converting the energy from glucose to ATP. The rest is given off as body heat. And that was a great question that I, a family member asked me at Thanksgiving. Is why, you teach anatomy, right? Yeah. Well, why is it that when I'm out in the woods and I'm hunting and it's 20 below, that my body is still 98.6? I said, well, <laughs> we could have gone through this whole thing. <laughs> I said, well, it's just metabolism, and heat is a waste product of metabolism. Oh, and that's what keeps us going. So that's the ans simple answer to that. All right, so this, again, just sums it all up. We already talked about that. So this is a nice animation. I don't have sound, so I'm just going to let you play this on your own. But it's a great visual of this process of cellular respiration. Yes? I'll probably go like 28 to 34, or it'll be obvious. It'll be a really one of the bigger numbers, 28, 30, 30. I won't use all of them to confuse you. <laughs> all right, so just refreshing again. If we have oxygen, we get carbon dioxide, high, uh, water, and ATP, and a lot of ATP, right? Up to, what, 34, your textbook says. We'll go with that number. So 34 ATP. If I don't have oxygen, we go to glycolysis, we get pyruvic acid, but we stop there. So pyruvic acid is converted to lactic acid. So what happens is that NADH that picked up some hydrogen atoms, it dumps them back on to pyruvic acid to form lactic acid. So then there is my lactic acid building up. And what does that do to pH if you have a lot of lactic acid building up in the blood? What is it going to do to pH? Lower it. And when we lower it, that causes acidosis. Metabolic acidosis is the problem. Chest pain is a symptom of lactic acid building up in heart muscle cells. When people said, oh, you know, this is burning sensation in my chest. Well, it might be acid reflux, so we always rule that out. But pressure is another sensation of lactic acid buildup. They feel a pressure in the chest, pain in the chest, burning in the chest. Weight, you know, people describe it as like there's a 100-pound weight on my chest. That's because there's poor blood flow. So the first thing we can do to patients that come into the ER with chest pain or that are in the bed and all of a sudden they're like, oh, my gosh, you've got this terrible chest pain, is try not to panic because I work on a cardio floor, cardiopulmonary floor, and when that happens, I'm like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. And you have to be calm and just move very methodically, but you're thinking, please don't, you know, code now. So when they say that, what do we want to do then? What do we know is happening in the cells? Because we know our cellular respiration. They're not getting enough oxygen, and they're going the meta that anaerobic pathway. So what do we want to do then? How can we fix it directly? Give them oxygen. So the first thing I'm going to do is reach over, put that oxygen on their nose, if they have it. If they, do, if they have oxygen, maybe I'll bump it up a couple liters. Not hugely so, but a couple liters just to help the process. Then I'm going to think, OK, we need to open up vessels to get the blood supply. There's, a, there's probably a narrowed artery. Maybe they're in waiting for bypass surgery. So now we want to figure out a way to open up the vessels quickly and improve the blood flow to that heart muscle. So what is a medicine that people with heart issues carry around in a little brown bottle? Yeah, nitroglycerin pills, right? Little tiny pills, you throw it under the tongue, it dissolves, and it dilates the vessels. And oftentimes, knock on wood, that works for patients on our floor. They'll feel better. Sometimes it takes three times. Or some people have a nitro drip, nitroglycerin drip, that they, not, it's not nitroglycerin, but it's a part of that um, compound. But anyway, we just open that up on the pump and increase the level until they're chest pain free. So that's what happens. People get in the hospital, they have this chest pain, they have this narrowing, they're waiting to decide what to do. They put them on the nitro drip, and then they tell their family, I feel great. I don't know why they don't just let me go home. <laughs> well, you can't go home on a nitro drip and carry it around your living room. So the goal is, is to fix the heart problem, prevent the, the anaerobic pathway and lactic acid buildup in those heart muscle cells. And heart muscle cells are sensitive to lactic acid. They can't 
just you know, throw it on the bloodstream and the liver will take care of it and convert it. It builds up inside the cell and can damage the cells over time. So chest pain is something we need to resolve. You don't just let it pass. And some of you may have relatives that are like, oh, I'm fine, I'll be fine, I'll just sit here. It goes away when I relax. And that's true. They might have it when they're mowing the lawn, you know, and they're doing something active. But if they're just sitting and watching TV or getting up and having their morning coffee and they develop chest pain, that's a very serious sign of impending heart disease and heart attack. And they need to be taken to the hospital via ambulance if it doesn't resolve with, I think, what, three doses of nitro, nitro under the tongue? So it's, that's your healthcare um, knowledge that you should bring to the bedside when it comes to metabolism. Anything that's causing more ATP production is going to build up potential acids in the blood. So when we have seizures, asthma, COPD, emphysema, choking, extreme activity, people that are you know, whacked on some of these drugs where they're just you know, running and wild and fighting, you know, that's going to cause a higher metabolism. It's going to cause lactic acid to build up, and that can cause pH to drop. So let's take a five-minute break.